starting off with the first step of this, this troubleshooting flow, which is starting simple. There are a few things, there are a few things to consider when you're starting simple. Um, the first is choosing, how do you choose a simple architecture, right? So how do you choose an architecture that's easy to implement and is likely to get you part of the way towards solving your problem without introducing um, as many bugs? And I think, you know, I think architecture selection is sort of one of the really intimidating parts of getting into deep learning um, because, you know, there's tons of papers coming out all the time and those papers are all claiming to be state of the art on some problem and they get really, really complicated really fast. Um, and I think, you know, in the limit, if you're trying to uh, get to maximal performance, then architecture uh, selection is challenging. But the good news is that I think when you're starting on a new problem, you can actually just follow a very simple set of rules that will allow you to pick an architecture that should do a, a decent job on the problem that you're working on. And so the, the very simple version of this is if your um, data looks like images, then start with a Lynette-like architecture. And then um, as your code base gets more mature and as you're confident that you don't have bugs in your data pipeline, then you should consider moving to something that looks like a ResNet. If your data looks like sequences, then sort of, I guess like the classical recommendation is to use an LSTM. Um, I think these days actually doing something like temporal convolutions or causal convolutions is maybe even a more sensible choice to start. And then when, um, you know, when, when your problem gets more mature, then you can move to an attention model or a wave net like model. And then for anything else, I would just start with a, a fully connected neural net with one hidden layer and then, you know, move on to something that depends on the specifics of your problem. Right. And so again, this is not, I'm not making any claims that these architectures are going to be the best for your problem, but I think they're going to be a good starting point and will allow you to get a baseline in place um, that will make implementing the thing, the state of the art thing down the road much easier. So you might say, well, you know, that that's great, but in reality, a lot of our data is doesn't look like one of these things. It in fact has contains multiple of these things. And so how do you deal with um, multiple input modalities into a neural network? The strategy I recommend here is you start by mapping each of those input modalities into a lower dimensional space. So for the images, we'll pass them through a convnet. And through the sequence, so through the sentence, we'll pass it through an LSTM. And then we'll take the output of those neural networks and we'll flatten them. So we get a single vector for each of the inputs um, that are going into the model. And then we'll concatenate those inputs, um, pass it through some fully connected layers to an output. Um, so again, this is, I would almost guarantee that this architecture will not be state of the art on this problem but it's a very easy thing to try and I think will work reasonably well. Okay, so we've chosen a simple architecture and the next thing to do is make sure that our hyperparameter defaults are sensible to start out with. Here are the, the recommendations I have for your starting points for your, for, um, your uh, sort of default hyperparameters. Um, so I like Atom Optimizer with um, the magic learning rate which is 3e negative 4. Don't ask why, it's magic. It just is. You, just have to, you have to try it for yourself and see. Um, if you're using a fully connected or convolutional model, you should start with ReLUs. If you're using an LSTM, you start, should start with TANH activations. Um, and these uh, weight initialization schemes. And then this is, I think, pretty important. I would always start with no regularization or data normalization um, because you know, those things are very important to achieving the final performance that you want for your model, but they introduce a ton of bugs. And so I'd start with not using them. And um, these are the, just the definitions of the initializers I recommended um, for the sake of completeness, but I won't go through them. Okay, so we've chosen a simple architecture where we've picked sens sensible defaults like the magic learning rate. And the next thing we need to do is normalize our inputs, right? And so this just means subtracting the mean and dividing by the variance. And for images, it's fine if you want to just scale the values between 0 and 1 or negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Um, and so this is like, this is one step that feels very small, but in fact is very important and can be the difference between your neural network working and not working. Um, so this is just something that's very important to remember to do. And then lastly, I would consider, I would at least consider simplifying the problem itself. So if you have a 
um, a problem that's you know complicated. You're working with a massive data set. You have tons of classes that you're dealing with. Um, then I would consider you know early on when you're working on the problem, instead working with a smaller version of your training set, or using say a fixed number of objects, a fixed number of classes, a smaller image size, or even like we're doing in the lab, a simpler synthetic training set. And the reason why I think this is important is because um, you, if you're working on a difficult problem and your performance is not good, then it's not clear whether your performance is not good because maybe the problem itself is too hard, or whether the performance is not good because you haven't done a good job of implementing your model. So I would always start with a problem that you have reasonable confidence that, you're, that your model should be able to solve. Um, the other reason why starting with a simpler problem is valuable is because this can increase your iteration speed. Right? So if you have a um, 10,000 image data set that can fit into memory um, that you can train on your laptop, then that's going to allow you to move much faster than if you need to sort of build a complicated data pipeline and push everything onto eight GPUs from the start. OK, let's come back to our running example. Um, so what's the simplest model that we might choose for pedestrian detection? So um, we might start with, like, let's say you know, we're a self-driving car company, so we have millions of images. But we might just start with a subset of 10,000 of those images. And we could use like a Lynette architecture with just you know, sigmoid cross-entry loss, atom optimizer, and no regularization. And so this, if I was implementing this from scratch, this might be the, the um, first model and first hyperparameters that I would choose. So to summarize, um, starting simple means choosing a simple architecture, and then using just sensible defaults for that architecture, normalizing your inputs, and possibly working on a simpler version of your problem to start. Any questions about this? So the first question is, how do you decide that it's time to switch from a simple model to a more complex model? Uh, it's a good question, and we'll talk more about that throughout the lecture. Another question is, can you explain why it is recommended not to normalize, but data scale normalization is important? Uh, not sure I understand the question. I think it's important not to normalize um, initially because, um, and by, by normalize I mean things like batch norm, layer norm, weight norm, um, those types of uh, normalization schemes. I think those are sort of super critical to achieving really good performance in the limit, like as you get to um, a large data set and a large model. But um, those, those normalization schemes and batch norm in particular are a huge source of bugs. And um, you know, I, I think if, if you want to make your life easy, I would debug everything else in your entire pipeline and then add normalization, because then you'll be able to tell whether that normalization is actually working. There is a recommendation to overfit your data first, I assume by using a complex model, and then regular, regularize, simplify. Uh, but how does this work with starting from a simple model? Uh, we'll talk more about sort of how you move on from the simple model in a bit. And um, how does this work for knowledge transfer? When, yeah, so the, or fine tuning, knowledge transfer and fine tuning. Yeah, so how do you fit fine tuning, uh, fine -tuning into this scheme? Um, I would add this, um, yeah, I, I would add, I'll, I'll tell you, so I think um, I'll flag the point in the, this process when I think you should add fine tuning, but I would start without using fine tuning. Like I would start just by seeing how well you could do on a really small data set with a model trained from scratch. And then um, when you get to the point where you're, you're sort of realizing the limits of not having used fine tuning, that's when I would add fine tuning. And um, I'll show you, I'll fl um, if I don't flag that point in the process where I think that should happen, then remind me and I'll, I'll point to it. Should we do hyperparameter search for the initial simpler models or just use sensible defaults? I would just use sensible defaults. You might do a little bit of hyperparameter search, like you might um, play around a little bit with the learning rate, but um, I would generally would not spend much time on that right away, at the beginning. Uh, someone is surprised that you would not use a pre-trained net for the pedestrian detection task. Okay. <laughs> I, di I didn't get the question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> should they be surprised? <laughs> 
I guess is the question. Um, no, I mean, again, like the, the point of this stage of the process is really, this is like a, you know, we start, you know, the goal is to add one layer of complexity at a time so that we can isolate what is causing any um, suboptimal performance in our entire system, right? And so I think, um, you know, eventually we might want to start with a pre-trained net. I would be, I really hope that self-driving car companies are not just like downloading a pre-trained net and using that for their pedestrian detection. Um, but a reasonable thing might be to do that, to fine tune something like that. And I think um, that's something that we'll add later on. Later on. What's an easy way to convince my team of using a simpler model first? Um, have them watch this lecture. <laughs> uh, would you start writing your code from a computer without a GPU before moving to the server? Yes. That, how often would you debug a neural network in production? Uh, hopefully you should be past the debugging stage by the time you get to production. Yeah. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit. There's other things that, there's other types of um, monitoring that you should do in production. And there's other ways that your, the performance of your model can degrade in production. And Sergey will talk about some of them this afternoon. But um, I think, yeah, if, if you're deploying models into production that have bugs in them, then that's not a good sign. Is there a model zoo that you use? I don't use a model zoo, typically. Um, I think my, my view on, yeah, no, maybe that's a good segue into implementation, because I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my view on that there. <laughs> 